Well, a couple of weekends ago now, uh, the youth went to uh, Resurrection, and they wanted to, to share a little bit about their experiences this morning, so we've set aside a little bit of time today for them to, to talk about uh, uh, their, their time spent there and how it helped. Zach? Hi. Um, like he said, a few weekends ago, we went to a wonderful retreat um, called Resurrection. This year, we had the opportunity to take 10 of our youth, four of which had never been before, um, which was really awesome, and they had a great time. Um, and before I say anything else, I just want to say thank you for how you, the congregation, helped get us there, how you blessed us and commissioned us to go and receive and learn and do. Um, and a special thanks to all my parents, Christy, uh, Leslie, and Rusty, and how you all just help it made it all come together, made my life a little easier. Um, and for Angie and her husband feeding us and always opening their home. Um, but yeah, so resurrection, mountaintop experience. Um, and mountaintop experiences uh, are really important in our lives. Um, they can be catalysts. Uh, for transformation and transfiguring in our lives. Like, it's not going to happen all at once, but it's a, it's a start of something. It's planting seeds, it's helping us grow, it's causing us to think. Um, and we ascend the mountain for a number of reasons, but more often than not, the underlying reason of that is to gain perspective, new perspective on something. Um, and at the peak of the mountain, we can see uh, where we've been, where we are now, and where we could go. Um, and we, f we just find direction. And consequently, while we're up on the mountain, we can see the, the reality and our world from God's perspective and find a holy clarity uh, for the vision of our lives and what he has for our lives. And not only like vision and like clarity in that sense, but also, sorry, uh, we get, on top of the mountain, we're away from the noise of the world. We have a moment to step aside to, we don't hear all the noise and the lies of the world or whatever. We have a moment to actually clearly hear God's voice, to feel his presence, and to hear his words so that when we come down from the mountain, we can hold on to those words and we're more attuned to the, our shepherd's voice. Um, so that in the midst of all the noise as we come back down the mountain where we live, we have that new perspective, we know where we're going, we have his perspective, we have his word, and we can continue to grow. Now on the mountain this weekend, we played, we worshiped together, we broke bread together in more ways than one. Um, we had a whole lot of fun, uh, and we just, we prayed together and dove into what God would have for us this weekend. And we were led in worship by a band called I Am They. Uh, they're from Nevada. And then our speaker was Rachel, Reverend Rachel Billups, who was a wonderful, spunky, fiery woman uh, who was from Ohio. Uh, and she just brought the word and perspective to us. Um, Friday night, it was all about works in progress. Uh, and what does that mean for our lives? Um, that we are a work of progress in God's hands. Uh, we talked, and that all led into identity the next day, um, and how maybe some of the pitfalls that would help would cause us to give up our identity, like comparing ourselves to others and other things in our lives, and how that kills our connection to God and who He says that we are. And then also about some of the temptations that are before us, as she talked about. Esau and uh, his brother Jacob and what was our stew what was set before us tempting us to give up our birthright identity that Christ has given us and then we wrapped it all up Sunday with we are works in progress now let's take our faith public and not be so scared or ashamed of being a work in progress because Christ is the author and finisher of our faith and he's not going to leave us unfinished on his potter wheel. He's going to continue to mold us as long as we choose to walk with him and be on that potter wheel and in his hands. 
So we have a little bit of a picture presentation, slideshow. I have no idea what all pictures are on there, so no judging me or them. But these are, uh, you stand up for a minute, let them see you. Uh, these are all of our youth. Uh, a few of them couldn't be here today uh, for family things, and a couple were sick. But yeah, that's going around. But there they are. And the show. say one last thing real quick to explain something. <laughs> there are three tables where life happens around, at least in my book. It's the Holy Trinity of tables. 
Uh, it's the table where we break be- bread together and we eat and we fellowship there. The Lord's table where we take communion, which we did it up there. Our bishop did that. And then the pool table. <laughs> the pool table is where real life happens and we have real talks and we learn from one another. I taught them how to play a diff- couple different games, but that's what I grew up in college with and it's where I had some of the most real talks and that's why there was so much pool table action going on in those pictures. But again, thank you for sending us and from all this we have a whole lot more questions that will help us guide us on our journeys uh, and some things to keep on unpacking as we move forward. This wasn't just a one and done arrive, this was a launching uh, for us, so thank you. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let's pray. Gracious God, we open our hearts to your presence this morning. We gather in your name and we know that you are here. We look with great anticipation for you to speak to us today. May we hear your word and have the courage to follow it and the strength to to proceed with our calling. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and join as we sing together hymn number 16 with the optional last setting of All Hell to Power.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together, to be with brothers and sisters in Christ. We may not even know each other's names, but we are bound by your Holy Spirit. And may we look into one another's eyes and see each other as you see us with hearts filled with love, always seeing the potential and the good and not just the, the differences or the mistakes. Lord, may your power of redemption work in our lives to help us when we fall short. May we be ready to receive your grace, undeserved as it is. It is the most precious gift. May we take those opportunities to, to better ourselves and thus, by extension, better this world by our presence in it, by being more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May his peace reign in our hearts, even in the midst of turmoil. May we know that these things are temporal and will pass. Help us to hold on to that which is eternal and lasting. In this world, it is not the material things that will matter, but the loves that we have, friends and family, those of us in fellowship. Lord, may we also recognize that we each have meaning and purpose in our lives. May we embrace that. May we live it as fully as possible not through just our own strength and determination, but through the power of your Holy Spirit. For we know that with you, nothing is impossible. This is our prayer, both as individuals and as the body of Christ, which is the church. And Lord, we move forward with this expression of unity by sharing the words of our Lord in prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Ways that you have blessed us so abundantly. And we now from our hearts and out of love share this with your body, asking that it be used in accordance with thy will. Amen. If you would, please stand and join as we sing together in hymn number 463, the first two and final two verses of I Will Remember Thee.
Scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter, verses 21 through 28, if you'd like to follow in your Bibles or the Pew Bibles provided. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in the synagogue came. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. The word of God for the people of God. Maybe be seated. My soul arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Before the throne my surety stands, before the throne my surety stands. My name is written on his hands. My name is written on his hands.
Even if you don't follow the sport, most likely you know that today is Super Bowl Sunday. It's remarkable how this simple game has grown to the immense proportions that it has in its 52 years. Even the commercials that air during the game have become a phenomenon in themselves. A 30-second spot in Super Bowl I cost $37,000. That same amount of time this year will cost you over five million dollars. There was a diehard fan who was to see an empty seat at the Super Bowl, and he said something about the woman who was about it to the woman that was sitting by it. And she said, "It was my husband's," she explained, "but he died." "Oh, I'm so very sorry," the, said the man. And after they sat there a moment, he goes. I'm a little surprised, though, that uh, another relative or a friend or, or someone else didn't jump at the chance to take his seat. And uh, she says, beats me. They all insisted on going to the funeral. <laughs> now, I, I love football. I, I won't apologize about that. I played it. I like watching it. Uh, just about at any level but I also keep it in perspective and sometimes I wonder what it would be like if, if an alien race or even just other cultures were to look down at us and see 66,000 people who are willing to pay at least three thousand dollars for a seat to sit in a stadium that costs 975 million dollars to watch 22 men being paid seven to $25 million themselves, dispute the possession of a ball that costs $9.97 at Walmart. <laughs> Here's the big question. Does God like football? Now, according to some, he not only likes it, he actively participates. How many players have you heard or seen give God all the glory or the credit for their scoring or their victory. We've had the Immaculate Reception by Franco Harris of the Pittsburgh Steelers. We had the Miracle in Nashville with the Tennessee Titans that propelled them to the Super Bowl. Notre Dame, they have the touchdown Jesus. But I'm always curious as to the outcome of the game when both sides always seem to claim to have him on their side. Former coach Bill Parcell said, no disrespect to anyone, but it usually works better when the players are fast and good. My favorite cartoon regarding this shows a football player running down the field, scoring and saying, this touchdown's for you, Jesus. And the next panel shows Jesus in heaven and he's watching a hockey game. <laughs> As a kid, I remember being at a Tennessee Volunteers football game and the minister delivering the opening invocation at the end of his prayer specifically asked God to let the Tennessee Volunteers get a bid to the Peach Bowl. Even as a young teenager, I thought that was a little weird and maybe asking a bit much of the Lord. And when I read today's scripture, I picture conflict. This is Jesus meeting a demon head on. Now, if you've never seen the NFL films that, that recap games, you, you've, you've really missed something because it's amazing the drama that they can drum up and, and, and put on into this, with, especially with the narration, the dramatic music and the narration. It'd be something like this. They went to Capernaum, where Jesus wanted to teach people a lesson. But his opponent had a different idea. A demon from the other side, an evil spirit, makes an interception and tries to head things the other direction. But Jesus lines up against his old nemesis, ready to play. The demon trash talks Jesus, what are you doing here? We know you. You here to do something to us? And Jesus fires back. As a matter of fact, I am. 
Jesus then sacks him in the backfield with a crushing blow, and the man convulses and cries out loudly, and then game over. Of course, the crowd goes wild. The people are amazed. They interview one man. I ain't never seen nothing like it. Jesus pumps his chest and points to the sky. I just want to thank myself and give myself all the glory. <laughs> now, of course, it wouldn't have been that silly as it actually happened. It's kind of comical how they make that drama for what is just a game. But what I read about was more than a game. There was much more at stake, real things at stake. It's easy to look at this confrontation in, in the synagogue and see two players, Jesus and the demon, good versus evil. But it's not that simple, is there? There's something else there, the man. He's the major character in this confrontation. That means that the stakes today are you. Have you ever been involved in picking teams back in school days? It's a traumatic childhood memory for a lot of people. The coach or the teacher would line everyone up on the baseline in the gym, and then it would begin. Two extremely lucky kids, or perhaps teacher's pets, would get pulled out from the line by the teacher or the coach and told they were the captains. And they got to pick who was gonna be on their team. They were the lucky ones because they didn't have to stand there and wonder who was gonna pick them, what side they would be on, who wanted them. Now we all had different reasons to worry about this. For one, we wanted to be on the winning team. For another, perhaps we didn't want to get separated from our friend. But more than anything, what did we dread the most about picking teams? You didn't want to get picked last. Oh, 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 pick me, pick me, pick me. God forget, forbid if you were ever one of the last two or three standing there in the line waiting to hear your name. We like to go through our lives thinking that we're the captains in charge of our destiny. In real life, it's more like we're lined up and waiting. In a sense, you have already been picked from your birth. Imagine the chilling scene of the devil standing over us as we're born and saying, I'll take this one too. And we play on his side for a long time, not even realizing it. After all, possession is nine-tenths of the law. But here's the good news. The other team wants you even more. They are willing to sacrifice to have you with them. And they are the winning team. The battle is really fought within the person, in this case, within that man. Come out of him, Jesus commands. But the game is not over. It's just beginning. Sure, we Christians want to be on Team Jesus, but do you know if you're on a football team and, and you get the ball and you run the wrong direction? You can score for the other team. You're still part of that team, but you're working against your efforts. We're still on the Lord's team, but our actions can hinder the kingdom if we go the wrong way, if we do the wrong things. And Jesus knows that we always have this battle within, but he can help. He can level the playing field with the strength of his Holy Spirit, and he calls us to be decisive play on his side. In many ways, the victory's already been handed us, but now we have to go out on the field and make it happen. Many commentators will speak of how one team should definitely beat the other on paper. Probably heard a lot of this this week. If 
you paid attention at all. But the outcome is always determined on the field. And so we have that old adage, that's why they play the game. Here's my Super Bowl prediction for this evening. Someone will do something spectacular. Something will happen to someone that's unexpected, and it'll either be awful or awesome. A player will perform less than expected, while another will certainly prove to be the star of the day, the hero. A referee will make a call that is praised by some, criticized by others, no doubt controversial. But the game will decide who the winner is. And the commentary of the last two weeks will not matter whatsoever. God has the power to enter this called life and take on everyone and everything. But his role is more like a coach in our lives in that he gives us an outline of how to win. We have to go out and make it happen. Every day we have that choice. I've made my ultimate choice of what team I'm on, but every day I have to determine who has possession of my heart and soul. One of the things I learned playing football was that success does not come easy. During a Monday night football game years ago featuring the Chicago Bears, one of the announcers made a comment about one of my favorite players of all time. He observed that Walter Payton, the Bears running back, had accumulated over nine miles in career yards at that point. The other announcer was quick to remark, yeah, and that's with someone knocking him down every 4.6 yards. It's hard. And that's why it's critical for us to surround ourselves with a good team. We just won't go as far on our own. And that's why the Lord gave us the church. We work together. We're there for each other. As it says in Ecclesiastes 4, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. The cord of three strands is not easily broken. I'd also say and point out that not everyone can be the quarterback, the star. Every position is vital to a team if they're going to win. For example, the field goal kicker, often the smallest person on the team, spends the least amount of time on the field, but how many times does his actions determine the outcome of the game? Even the foot is important, Paul might say. We all have jobs to do for the kingdom. We're to labor together in this church to accomplish the goals that Jesus has set before us. And it takes everyone giving 100%. Or, as my football coach used to illogically demand, 110%. We'll make mistakes. But that's another thing I learned during my playing days. You can't obsess over what's done, what's already happened. You have to shake it off and move on. If you can remember some of these simple things, apply them in your lives, and move forward, that would be super. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we seek your direction. We seek your encouragement. We ask you to lay before us the, the ways that we should go, the things that we should do. Help us to be courageous in following your commands. And help us to, to strengthen one another as we live out the calling that you have for us. We ask you to watch over each of us. Help us when we fall. May we see the ways that we can lift one another up. And may we truly work towards the building of your kingdom with all that we say and do. In Jesus' name we pray.
it's an issue for you, just let our stations know when you come forward. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. To ask those who are assisting me to come forward at this time.
AM, 747, Sunshine in My Soul. Ultimately, we're not too concerned about football fields, but we are concerned about mission fields, and you are about to enter it. Go forth, equipped with the strength of the Lord to serve him in that area. Amen. Amen. 